you very much. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm joined on stage. This is our first of uh, two double acts um, uh, that we've got on stage, but I'm joined by Patrick, who's our head of Instant Response at Integrity 360. I talked about it a little bit this morning about you know, uh, that ability to respond and recover. And for Integrity, that is Patrick and his team um, that are helping our customers stand out. So you're surprising at how many um, uh, organizations are calling upon our incident response um, services uh, as they find them in that state of, uh, of breach. And obviously, what, what I find is because you know, a lot of the talks I do are based upon information that I've extracted from Patrick and his team's um, heads that they've, you know, talking about their experiences. So I, I find that that's really important to understand. You know, you know, I always sort of say it's, you know, it's great to learn from, uh, from mistakes, but it's even better to learn from somebody else's mistakes or where they've gone wrong. So hopefully what we can do is impart some of that knowledge, looking at you know, our experience in the IR field over the last 12 to 18 months through the form of statistics, you know, what's cropping out, what's occurring over and over again, and then actually diving down into two case studies. Um, of incidents that Patrick and his team have investigated and helped customers respond to. And the great thing about doing that is we can actually dive down into the look at, well, actually, you know, what were the actions that actually happened? So we can get a view of what exactly all those steps that uh, the attacker went through, um, how organizations responded, why were they successful? Because, um, you know, generally Patrick's team's only being called in once there's been, you know, they've got through that stage of, um, uh, you know, getting... Uh, initial foothold all the way through to the point of where they're being discovered. That's where Patrick's team get uh, called in. Um, you know, just while I'm uh, just praising Patrick and his team, I think you know of all the organi all the teams in our business, you know, that get praised for the work they do in and out, inside and out, uh, uh, every single day. It's Patrick's team that probably gets the most, um, which really just sort of echoes how supportive they are of our customers and how quick they're able to respond uh, to help us help those customers through what are you know very tricky and difficult incidents. Um, overall. Um, so I'm just going to jump on and uh, actually we can, I'll hand over to Patrick really to start talking through our IR stats. So I'll say these are things that Patrick and his team have observed and gathered over the last 12 to 18 months and really to pull out some of those insights. So Patrick, I'll hand over to you now. Cheers, Rich. Just checking you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, the top initial access methods uh, we've seen this year, or actually into 2023 as well, is on patch vulnerabilities. So uh, although phishing still it's still pretty popular. Um, we're definitely seeing a massive rise in unpatched vulnerabilities. So the actual instance we've dealt with, um, yeah, unpatched vulnerabilities is right up there. Um, so you've got credential compromise. This is the likes of, you know, VPNs that are left with no MFA, that kind of thing. Those are still, that's, that's still pretty common these days as well for initial access. Um, and then phishing is the last thing I mentioned. So, yeah. Um, just, just on that, sorry, just jump in there. So um, I think when we talked before, the you know, it's not just that unpatched vulnerabilities are the, are the number one. It's mm. by a considerable margin yeah. um, that we're seeing organizations being breached. And not only just by being unpatched vulnerabilities, but the bigger problem is that unpatched known vulnerabilities. You know, and whether it's legacy systems, whether it's things that are just in there that you know, the, the patch has been available for not just days, weeks, for a significant amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm going to go into it later, but we've got a case study where a customer had a uh, on-premise facing device that uh, was classed as not vulnerable, but it actually was vulnerable to a uh, pretty nasty vulnerability. So that's, I mean, it's hard to patch against that, right? So it's like a zero day. <laughs> you can't really, if Microsoft says it's not vulnerable, and it is, there's not a lot you can do there. So... Um, yeah, moving on. Um, so most interesting breach that we've had is uh, Android firmware rootkit. So this was where, uh, you know, in, in meeting rooms, you often have these little Android kiosk devices to, you know, say that, you know, Bob Jones has rented this room out for the next two hours. Uh, we had a customer that called us about some of them that were making some suspicious connections back to China. Uh, we investigated and pulled them apart and found that, yeah, there was uh, firmware, Chinese malware uh, built into the firmware uh, that was phoning home and basically sending all the details about their uh, emails because uh, it was connected to the domain back to the, back to the uh, company that it was built by. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that one was that it was a rootkit in that if you reinstalled the firmware or you basically did an update, it would still be there. It would come back. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that company quickly got rid of those devices. Let's put it that way. Um, average, I don't trust everything that comes through the door from Amazon, I think, is the take Yeah, it was, it was Amazon that sold them, um, but <laughs> it just goes to show you've got to check exactly what kind of Internet of Things devices that you've got in your environment, because they could have backdoors in. 
Um, average amount of data exfiltrated is two terabytes that we've seen. Um, this is growing because I think A, because the internet connections is, is obviously a lot faster, but B, it's becoming more and more common for threat actors to, to, to steal data in, uh, as well as encrypt um, because the ransom payment, so companies that actually pay ransom is going down in, in general uh, per, you know, per company that gets uh, compromised. So the threat actors are basically, you know, how can I maximize my profit from this? I'm gonna steal, try and steal as much data as I can and then extort you using that way instead. Um, most common vulnerabilities we've seen, um, Citrix, so there was Citrix bleed in, uh, well, it was actually, it was actually discovered uh, last, I think it was uh, November time, uh, but yeah, Citrix bleed, there was another remote code execution vulnerability in Citrix last year as well. Um, Avanti, pretty nasty one at the start of this year, so that was the Avanti Pulse Secure VPNs, and then Atlassian, uh, we had a number of, a, a number of, Incident response retainer customers uh, that have had Atlassian, Atlassian devices where we've uh, checked if they've been compromised. So, um, most common adversaries, Lockbit is still number one. Um, I mean, I, th I think the average uh, since the start of 2024, uh, they're almost twofold any other threat and ransomware threat actor, and that's despite them being their servers being compromised by the FBI about th about two or three weeks ago. So, <laughs> they're, they're you know they're very much very much still very very uh, common and some of the, uh, I'd say their ethics are something to look out for as well because they're, they're not the most, uh, they haven't got the nicest of their ethics. Uh, Black Buster, um, those guys pretty common and then Alpha V or Black Cap, uh, we've seen those guys quite a lot as well. Not motivation is still money but obviously with the uh, Russia-Ukraine war there's, uh, there's still an element of you know political strength there that there'll be a political reasoning and uh without getting too political myself uh, the israel and gaza um issue at the moment um that's that's more and i always get asked like what kind of malware and that, you know what kind of attacks do you see in that kind of area and it's more kind of social media attacks that you see in that you know misinformation and that kind of stuff so but what you know we're yet to see uh, i mean iran for example has one of the most prominent apt groups and cyber groups so um, those guys could start to, you know, attack the other side, basically. So we might see that more commonly. Um, the average time before a company realizes it's compromised, um, the shortest we've seen is 23 minutes, so fair play to that company. Uh, the average is about two weeks, and then the longest I've seen is eight years. So eight years was a uh, APT, so it's Adv Advanced Persistent Threat, basically a, you know, a state-sponsored threat actor that the, 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 the majority, majority of state sponsored threat actors that stay in the network for a long time like that is purely because they can, you know, harvest the information, get as much as they can. Uh, and, you know, it's not all about the money. It's about the espionage and the, the amount of information they can, they can get. Yeah, and George, you know, on that, I think that's quite important because if you, you know, depending on what um, data breach report that you're reading, you can see anything from, you know, 260 days right down to, to 40 days. And actually, in reality, what we're seeing, we see this over and over again, um, I think we covered on one of these case studies, but we've got a few other ones that uh, that we talk about as well. And actually, yeah, that two-week period is generally all it is. Um, and actually, when we look at it, and we'll see it on one of the case studies, you know, it might be a long period, but the actual period of activity is extremely small and extremely quick um, as we go through you know, as they go through the stages of the attack. So you know, it's uh, a lot more um, impactful, quicker than uh, than a lot of uh, the industry uh, and, and or in our view, at least, of what we see, that it is very short in terms of that uh, uh, lifespan of the attack. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's absolutely right. Yeah, the the time. The actual, t the actual dwell time when they're really active, yeah, it's like, you know, a day or two. So, yeah, yeah it's really, really quick. Um, biggest, biggest cyber mistakes we've seen in terms of defense. Um, antivirus, uh, customer paid a massive amount for antivirus, uh, EDR, but it was left in passive mode. So basically still the POC mode. So there was no actual <laughs> detection in there. It wasn't actually doing anything. Um, we've seen a domain controller put in a DMZ um, environment, which is for those IT admins out there, that's a big no-no. Your DMZ should be for your stuff that if it gets compromised, it's not as bad as if it's on the inside. Um, then using plain FTP, yeah, we still see that in 2024. Um, account sharing and then passwords stored in an Excel. So we still see that these days. Um, and then the most common triage calls we get, um, help my mouse is moving by itself, uh, which is usually uh, a result of uh, a cat or something, you know, running across the keyboard. <laughs> it's almost never in a, an actual incident. It's always a false positive. Um, and then help someone is buying guns using my bank, which Actually, that happened to my mum. <laughs> Someone was buying AK-47s with her account, and the bank rang her and said, oh, is, is that you? Are you buying an AK-47? And she was like, obviously not. 
Um, and then our, you know, our website redirects to some dodgy place, so that's quite common as well. Um, but yeah, we get all sorts. Yeah, so that's just a highlight and a high level view of you know, what we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months. So now you know, we can take it down a level and actually get into the detail of, of a couple of those incidents um, and hopefully bring some insights and, uh, and some learnings from those. So just the first uh, case study we've got here is on sort of critical natural infrastructure, so utilities uh, based organization. Um, so 3,000 employees. Um, you know, billions in terms of revenues uh, every year, but hit by the lockbit uh, ransomware that we got called in to, to assist with. I think if I, and you know, I'll hand over to Patrick in a second to go through some of the detail, but the things that I would call out in here that I think are, are, are interesting, um, uh, and you know, I'm sure you'll come on to some of those bits, was um, you know, this is probably an example of where your security, their security posture didn't stack up to their expectation, what they thought they had in place, which is a real big learning for them. Um, and also that time period, you know, in the environment for two years, and obviously this is a APT group or um, a serious threat actor that, you know, when Patrick's team has investigated, we see that they've been in the, in the environment for two years trying to work their way towards their target. Um, but actually the real part of the attack of where they went from just that snooping around, start trying to be as covert as possible, to then being more overt to then uh, to, to activate it. it was actually that two-week period. So that last piece is that, that you know happens extremely quickly. So if you're not spotting that early uh, activity, then you know you're going to be uh, in a in a you know a real sort of trouble situation once it does happen because that speed that uh, the things move. And obviously the you know the impact's also important as well. You know so that sort of you know uh, prolonged period of business outage um, and then end up regulatory fines. Um, uh, uh, that uh, and actually that was an interesting thing to go through as well. Was actually that was the impact from that breach on their organisation. But then having to stand up and go through that process with the data commissioner, with the ICO, um, and if anyone, you know, hopefully you never have to go through that process, but then actually getting all of those questions to say, well, actually, what did you do to secure that personal data, that PII data that has left the organization? And actually going into real scrutiny at that point, um, uh, you know, to work out how much they're going to fine you. So, you know, they really get into the weeds on that and really understand your did, did your security posture stand up to what you thought it was? Did you have the controls in place? And were you auditing those controls to make sure they're effective? So I'll hand over to Patrick, and you can go through the details of this one. Yeah, and I just want to say personal a personal point is if you ever get uh, if you ever have to speak to the DPC or the ICO, make sure get lawyers to do it. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, because <laughs> they are pretty. They go into a lot of detail. So. Um, yeah, so this client um, was spearfished um, roughly about two years before the incident. Um, as, as Rich said, yeah, they, they, there wasn't a lot of activity in the, the initial kind of two years. Um, they were just kind of sitting sitting on their access, um, really. I mean, we, we actually sus suspect it was initial access actor, um, but, but it, you know, we couldn't tell because obviously, so what, what they did was once they'd got in using that initial phishing email, they deployed Cobot Strike as well as a backdoor, so SDB bot, um, a backdoor based on shim databases, which is pretty rare. You don't see that used, that's quite sophisticated. Um, once they'd done that, they, they kind of just sat on it. So we didn't see any activity. We just saw that Cobot Strike was uh, destroyed, sorry, deployed about two years ago. And then the activity after that two years was was there wasn't a lot of activity. We didn't see any kind of lateral movement or anything like that. So that's what makes us think it was an initial access uh, actor. So basically, uh, that's a group that would give access or sell their access to a ran ransomware threat actor, you know, like Lockbit or you know Conti. So that's what happened. Uh, Cobalt Strike was deployed to about 30 core servers um, over the next kind of six months. It was just deployment, nothing else. Um, and then about 18 months in, uh, we started to see heavy and frequent activity. Um, so we saw uh, credentials stored. Uh, well, the, actually, it was the customer that had credentials stored in a plain text uh, spreadsheet and OT. And uh, also, they had uh, operational technology SCADA diagrams in there. So it's just worth mentioning that this is a critical national infrastructure, utility org. They, they had controls to various SCADA, you know, industrial, industrial control devices as well. Luckily, it was all in a separate OT environment, but they still had like diagrams and um, so it was, it was seg segmented in the OT environment, but they still had like diagrams, passwords for that environment, all that kind of stuff st stored in plain text on their normal IT environment. So the threat actor found these uh, and uh, we could see that they'd stolen them, they exfiltrated them because later on when the threat actor sent the ransom note, they basically threatened that they had access to the utility companies 
uh, you know, industrial control systems and stuff. And that's what they use to kind of really scare the customer. And also they sent it, sell, sent it to the public as well saying, you know, we've got control of these industrial control systems. We can do a lot of damage. We haven't just ransomware. We're, we've actually got control. And uh, yeah, pretty pretty nasty. Um, the It was, yeah, pretty pretty scary anyway for that customer um, and then their customers as well, obviously. Um, so about an exfiltration of about 10 gig, uh, 10 terabytes was was taken using our clone um, to mega.io. So that's the uh, what used to be called, is it Megashare? I can't remember now. Uh, the one by the Kim.com guy in New Zealand anyway. But So that was uploaded to mega.io. Um, the reason that the customer was um, alerted to the incident was because a SQL database just, just a standard database, you know, nothing special, just had a, had a lot of just kind of utility company data in it, um, crashed. And so the database analyst, just the database team, was having a look through and came across some logs. So they were, you know, they were seeing why did it crash. And in the logs, you could see a data dump command run. So it was basically obvious, and it was from an account, from a user account, that had not, they'd never seen before. So obviously these database guys knew what counts were in there. They saw this account that was not, they didn't recognize it and a dump command. And then that's when they called us. So they had basically, they had an instant response retainer with us, but they didn't have like MDR or MSS or anything like that. They, first thing they did, called us and said, yeah, uh, we've, can you have a look at this for, for us basically? So we had a look, we said, yeah, that's obviously a, an exfiltration event. Uh, and then we investigated more and then that, that's how we found out that they've been in for two years. So we basically, yeah, um, <laughs> the threat actors kind of shot themselves in the foot there with that database crash command. Um, the funny thing there is they actually did it twice because so it crashed once, threat actor, uh, and then the customer brought the database back up. Then they did it again and it crashed again. And that was the second time that the customer thought, hang on, let's investigate these logs. Um, so yeah, um. yeah. So yeah, we walked through that kind of case study and the, the steps that they've taken. I think there's uh, it's probably sort of more in the interest of time. We'll jump onto kind of the the lessons learned uh, there, and um, uh, and I suppose you know part of that um, piece being the, the the credentials and you know what we see over and over again is still credentials stored in clear text, as you sort of mentioned, Patrick, which is given the keys to the kingdom. Um, uh, in this instance, you know they, they'd obviously had a, a clear target of that OT environment, and importantly, it was it was segmented. But because that information was there, they could you know, scaremonger. And again, just finding those levers that they can pull to try and carry out the extortion alongside the uh, the ransomware encrypting activity, which they never got to at that point because um, uh, we sort of stepped in at that point to um, uh, uh, to try and mitigate uh, uh, that. But obviously, through a, um, a coordinated effort. If we look at you know, those, uh, some of those other um, uh, lessons learned, particularly around monitoring, I mean, if you look at that whole period, two years of activity, even if you just look at the cobalt strike individually, that is going to be beaconing out on an ongoing basis to allow people to access it. You know, that should be identified. So being able to monitor those network connections. I think the network still gets forgotten a little bit because we just, you know, um, say so we all work from home and um, uh, and it's hard to, to, to monitor the network. Actually, network security is important. Actually monitoring the activity and behavior, particularly abnormal behavior from uh, from hosts in the network is you know, critically important. From a monitoring point of view, you know, they um, had a seam tool in place and that was just, this is probably that argument of security versus compliance, just ticking a box there, John. The, the, the audit question was, do you have a seam? The answer was yes. When we actually looked into that, I said, oh, great, can we have some of that information from it? It only covered 1% of all of their um, uh, servers in their environment. So it mean, we're, you know, Patrick's team were completely blind and having to you know, try and piece together everything from logs they can get from source systems, which as you know, will, will uh, roll over very quickly or getting that uh, forensics data overall. Um, there's some of the sort of key points. I said segmentation is another one that's, that's seen very regularly. You know, not having the network segmented, which just means that you've got, you know, the lateral movement is just so much easier if you can just go from system to system. And also you're completely blind to all that activity. Um, you know, if you've got no point to monitor that activity, you've got no point to, to prevent them, then it's very easy to, uh, uh, to rip through an organization very, very quickly. So, so we'll just move on to the second case study now. So um, uh, energy, but slightly different in terms of the uh, the industry. Um, you know, just around 2,000 employees, uh, and again, sort of, you know, as you can imagine, in the energy sector, billions in terms of uh, revenue, uh, and hit with the Conti uh, ransomware. Mm -hmm. um, now, this one we're seeing, you know, the entire activity in the course of a month, um, and actually, you know, what we see over and over again is that kind of preventable incident happening. And this one, you know, although there were some things, some mitigating 
arguments about, and Patrick will get into the detail of, you know, it was a log4j exploit. You know, I think we've only seen two of those uh, so far, uh, and one um, is it was a completely unpatched system, uh, VMware Horizons, the VDI platform that was just left and unpatched. That was just a, a bit of an own goal there. In this instance, this was um, a Microsoft SharePoint server, uh, which Microsoft didn't uh, uh, disclose as being vulnerable to log4j. Um, so there's no need to go and patch it. So extremely hard to be able to identify it. Um, but uh, as, as Patrick will come on, you know, uh, there was you know, mistakes made um, that actually allowed that system to become at a point of being compromised. Um, overall, um, and yeah, again, you know, huge periods of uh, outage for an organisation. That's what you know. That that, uh, that that threat is very very real. Um, you know, that is the big lever that threat actors try and pull is to have that impactful outage inside of an organisation alongside that pull of data, so they can then you know do that double extortion um, overall. So I think I'll hand over to Patrick, and we can get into some of the details of this one. Yeah, I just wanted to say about that log for shell exploit um, when. When you're looking at logs and when you're looking at like how the threat actor got in, and then you see that log4j, um, for those that don't know, it's like a, you see the, the JNDI uh, request and you see the full full command in the uh, like the IAS logs or something like that, and the web server logs. Um, you kind of you, you you get a light bulb over your head and you're really happy, like oh I found it. But then the first thing you do then is you go right. So what's vulnerable to this? What's actually vulnerable? So I went and looked at the SharePoint. You know the where on the vulner vulnerabilities list of the log4shell because log4shell was everywhere, right? It was in loads and loads of things. It's built into uh, the log4j library. But when you looked at the share Microsoft share uh, on-premise SharePoint, um, is it vulnerable to log4shell? It said no, and I was just like scratching my head, like, but I can see it there. Why? <laughs> why is it saying no? And uh, until we actually did some digging and uh, we we spoke to Microsoft and basically it was undisclosed, so it it, it was actually vulnerable. It was, I, I mean I've got to just correct myself there. It was it was a certain version of Share, SharePoint on premise, so it wasn't all SharePoint on premise was vulnerable. It was just a specific version, which Microsoft said it wasn't vulnerable. So anyway, a bit of a scratching my head moment there. Um, but yeah, so this was an on on premise Microsoft SharePoint server. Um, I'm, I'm sure most most companies have this. Um, on cloud now, so the cloud SharePoint um, is, is much better at defending against these kind of attacks. The, the less, the lesser number of on-premise servers in terms of like external, uh, fa externally facing vulnerabilities is better in my opinion. Uh, but actually, in this case, this server wasn't actually supposed to be exposed to the internet. So this this co this company CISO um, said, um, I think it was roughly about a month before the incident, I want to be able to access my SharePoint server from home. I want to, you know, not thinking you know, not not knowing you know you've actually got vpns and things like this could, that can let you get in he just said no i want i just want pure straight access to this sharepoint server so they made it externally accessible which i can see some people shaking their heads yeah <laughs> that's that's just a no no you don't you don't expose your external so your your main internal sharepoint server to the internet right? so CISO by name only CISO by name only exactly so um Anyway, and we, we found all that chat log, and I said, so we, we don't, with instant response, we don't get involved in the politics of the of the company or anything like that. But that that did get uh, mentioned to the ICO, so I think that's gonna not gonna look good in their favour. Um, but yeah, so once this threat actor had got in, um, got in through us, using that way, um, lateral movement was done. So they used Mimi Cats to get the domain administrator credentials uh, straight away, just very, you know within the same day. Um, then Cobalt Strike was installed, so Cobalt Strike mentioned again, uh, but it's a very, very common tool used for putting back doors and laterally moving in a network. Um, a new user account was used, which we don't always see. Usually we see the threat actor just using an account that was already there, because uh, then they can hide it within regular use. But in this case, they decided to create a new user. I can't remember what the name was, but it was something really generic, like test user or something. Um, they accessed file shares, uh, they uploaded um, loads and loads of data to Dropbox. We don't know the total amount because uh, the customer didn't have any kind of uh, network telemetry. Um, so they, they were pretty pretty uh, uh, down on their luck with, with logs in terms of that. Um, and then they, in the end, they rolled out uh, the Phobos ransomware. I think that's named after Miles Moon anyway. But uh, the Phobos ransomware was deployed across the whole server estate, crippling the business. Um, and also, uh, there's not a point in there, but this was one of the rare attacks that they actually encrypted the uh, encrypted the servers from the hypervisor down. So they basically got onto the hypervisor where they could see all the virtual machines and then just encrypted the hypervisor itself with all the hosts stored on it. 
so that um, it was all the so they didn't actually have to the threat actor didn't actually have to log on to each individual um, box and encrypt all the files on it. They literally just encrypted the VMs themselves. So um, hard to recover from that unless you've got backups. So um, ransom note was left on desktops um, and a, there was a threat to release the data. Um, and then perhaps the most kind of disturbing bit was within like two or three days afterwards, like um, dotted like every two or three days after that, uh, the employees of that company started to get personal phone calls, uh, sorry, calls on their personal phones from a human, you know, not a robot or anything, from an actual human with a Russian accent saying, um, we, you know, we've got your data, we've got your passports, all that kind of stuff. Please, you know, pay the ransom. So I just think that's really, that's kind of nasty. That is, that's lowering the bar. That is going personal phones. Uh, you know, people at home just with their families and stuff getting calls from some, some you know, Russian threat actor. So, yeah. Um, and then the data was released to the dark web a week later. So, yeah, classic ransomware case, that one. Yeah, and, and again, just, you know, all those levers that uh, that are there to pull. Um, and, you know, the importance of protecting that data, um, you know, it's not just your customer data or your IP, you know, it's the PII that's related to uh, your employees that are obviously being used here in this case to, uh, to harass and harangue those employees and to tempt them into uh, paying that ransom overall. So I guess some of the lessons learned, and um, uh, we'll wrap up because just in the interest of time, just to make sure that uh, we give plenty of time for uh, uh, for Brian and Matt who are up next. Um, you know, patching obviously. Um, yeah, uh, Brian talked about this morning. You know, keeping on top of that exposure, um, visibility. Um, Overall, in terms of having the access, you know, the network, but also endpoint visibility. In this instance, I think I'm right in saying that you know they, they weren't well deployed in terms of network monitoring, in terms of endpoint monitoring, even you know, having an EDR in place, which we'd expect to be standard across most um, organisations these days. You know, there should be very few um, that, uh, uh, in, uh, customers or organisations that are just using base AV or even just uh, next gen AV. You know, having EDR in there is critically important to be able to identify activity within, within the environment, but also to be able to respond to that and have that telemetry in place. And that last piece there, which I suppose we didn't really dive into too much, is um, uh, you know uh, what we see over and over again, the difference between a prepared customer and an unprepared customer. That's what I was getting to this morning in terms of the response. It's not just being uh, you know uh, uh, Patrick's team coming in. It's actually the whole organization that needs to be prepared to respond, to understand the roles and responsibilities, to, particularly in terms of communication, what's going to happen. I think some of the things that we probably haven't touched upon here is you know of common mistakes that happen. You know, people spot something and they go and shut the machine down, which then completely erases all of that memory um, that allows Patrick's team, you know, their forensic efforts to identify exactly what's gone on. So you're almost helping the um, the, the, the threat actors at that point. But we quite often find, yeah, you know, sorry, conversely, when we're engaging with customers that uh, have an IR retained, that have gone through a preparedness exercise to understand those roles and responsibility, roles and responsibilities, that speed of execution uh, to respond to it makes all the difference in minimizing the impact. And quite often is the difference between you know, detecting and then being very careful not to allow an attacker to understand they've been detected, to build that strategy, how are we going to eradicate them in the, uh, out of the environment so we're safe, versus you know, triggering the threat actor to jump to that next level of going, well, I need to encrypt everything. Because you know, it's, you know, if the data's already been uh, exfiltrated and extracted out of the environment, you know, it's very hard to mitigate at that point, but you don't want to have that double impact of suddenly having a huge business uh, outage at the same time to deal with. Yeah, just, you know, being prepared is, you know, is critically important. Yeah, I just want to add to that that this uh, this company I think rang about four or five different IR companies. Uh, it was around two in the morning as well. So they had like they were trying to deal with all the, with, their, with you know with their whole network down ransomware like encrypted and stuff. They were having to deal with you know account managers and saying yeah this costs this much and all this kind of thing. So it just really highlights. Uh, the need for a, re a retainer because it's just, you know, it just gets all that preparedness out of the way. You don't have to deal with account financials. You have to get a PO at two in the morning. That's nearly impossible, isn't it? So, um, yeah. So, I mean, luckily they chose us, but I would say that. So, yeah. So that, that was it from us, just on our uh, uh, talk about IR. I mean, if anybody wants to go into details of, you know, of case studies, and I'll say we've got plenty more that we can walk through of, of mistakes and any kind of guidance on any of those things, you know, please find myself or Patrick around and we'll happily spend some time talking about it. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.